Well, good evening and thank you for coming in such large numbers. It's wonderful. <laughs> um, uh, I'm very happy to, um, first of all, uh, introduce the exhibition, uh, Shades of Compassion. And uh, we worked on this for two and a half years, my colleague Anne Sheridan and I, uh, together with Dr. Colkin and some educational uh, personnel. So John Colkin is a Renaissance man, a clinician of 30 years, global medical volunteer, 20 years, internationally recognized award-winning author, a photographer and musician, a integrative medicine health coach, an athlete, a philanthropist, and president of the Shades of Compassion Foundation. He's also a sought-after speaker with recent lectures at uh, Harvard, Tufts, and Duke universities. As a photographer, uh, Dr. Koken has a worldwide following with over 20 exhibitions internationally, and uh, his photographs has been, have been received have received over 20 awards. And uh, his book uh, has been honored with three international book awards. And his book is uh, Inner Harmony, Living in Balance. And we're fortunate to have some signed copies right over there. So if you want something personalized, uh, part of the uh, proceeds go to the museum. Um, after the lecture, there will be a question and answer session. And um, please help me welcome Dr. Corkin. I'd like to start by suggesting that you all give yourselves a pat on the back, because you made a choice to be here. And we make thousands of choices every day. And the fact that you wanted to be here in this incredible location and have a conversation about life balance is uh, commendable. So thank you for being here. As Barbara mentioned, we'll be talking about practical strategies for living a balanced life and guided by compassion and wisdom. First, gratitude. Um, oh, and the photographs you'll be seeing here are, are, are mine, if it has a title below it. To the museum, uh, this is a lovely, lovely space you have here, a jewel. And um, uh, it's just wonderful to be here. And you know, I thank them for, for, sponsor, for having this exhibition. Uh, there are lots of um, folks involved in putting this together. You know these faces, I'm sure. Um, Peter, Linda, Marnie, uh, and also members of the board, the sponsors, the docents, and so many other un, 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 uh, unsung heroes. Barbara and Ann have put their heart and soul into this exhibition, and I'm extremely grateful to them. We had consultants from Emory's uh, social, emotional, and ethical learning curriculum for K through 12 around the world. A world expert in the area of compassion, as is Life University's compassion and integrity training for adults. Uh, we had educators from MoMA and Minneapolis Institute of Art that were also involved. Um, His Holiness has been extremely supportive of my work for a number of years, and was even kind enough to contribute a forward uh, to the book. Um, his representatives have worked very closely with me on a number of projects around the world. And uh, I just met the Queen Mother of Bhutan this last year. She also contributed forward to the book, and um, uh, I owe my dedication to her. Our foundation uh, has been around since His Holiness asked me to help in supporting Compassion Worldwide. And the objectives are basically to develop and support compassion-centered initiatives around the world. Um, one of our primary focuses is compassion-centered um, museum exhibitions that are traveling this one around the US and another one worldwide. And we also do a number of other things in a variety of, of other areas. And last but not least, <laughs> 
You'll notice one young lady in the middle of all this. That's my four-year-old granddaughter, Caroline, and her supporting cast, uh, the rest of the family. Um, but now she's competing with her younger sister, uh, Joanna, who's one year old now. So first, just an outline of what we'll be going over today. Um, first, uh, what's, what's the source of true happiness? What are impediments to achieving true happiness? What are some practical strategies, universally relevant, that we could all um, consider to get us back on track? And then we'll open it up a little bit for conversation and questions. I'll speak for about 40 minutes or so. It should leave us about 15, 20 minutes for a conversation. So hopefully that will work out for everyone. I am going to be sharing my personal perspective for sure, but as a physician, it's also important for me to make sure that whatever I share also, whenever possible, has some scientific foundation to support it, fact-based. Um, just because people say, well, does this guy know anything about what he's talking about? Probably not, but people always want to know at least what your medical background is. Uh, I'll share that with you. Um, medical degree at Emory University, orthopedic residency, Wake Forest University, Hand Fellowship, University of Edinburgh in Scotland, integrated medicine uh, coaching at Duke University, uh, board certified orthopedic subspecialty, anything that goes wrong from the tip of your finger to just above your elbow. If you have any problems, we can set up the line afterwards and <laughs> we'll, we'll go over all that. <laughs> Clinical practice, uh, first eight and a half years in Lexington, Kentucky, two person group. Then um, uh, I co founded the Raleigh Hand Center, a large group in uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. And uh, dovetailing with that, 20 years of international uh, volunteer work living in a variety of countries throughout the world. Um, so, not a trick question. Who wants to be happy? Raise your hands. Come on. I, Peter, raise your hand. Thank you. There's all, there, are always, there are always one or two people in the back that don't raise their hands until I embarrass them. So I, I picked out Peter just for the heck of it. Um, so what is the recipe for happiness? Well, the research shows, that, shows us that there are five external factors that contribute to happiness. And this is regardless of your economic status, unless you're extremely poor. But the main thing first is shelter over our heads, some form of shelter. Number two, enough food to eat. Number three, potable water. Number four, a secure, safe environment. And number five, Harvard um, has an ongoing study that began in 1938 of men in a um, uh, depressed portion of Boston and have been following them up till now, looking at what are the key factors that have, de have determined which ones are happy and which ones are not. So number five, what they found, strong personal relationships, strong personal relationships, quality relationships. And actually, the American Academy of, um, of Family Medicine did a study of physicians, and they found that for them, it was the most frequent source of, of um, happiness was their relationships with family, colleagues, friends, uh, and patients. So those are the external factors. But the reality is that we don't always have control over everything that happens in our external environment. We just don't, no matter how much we try. But what we do have control over is how we're going to respond. That is a choice. That is a choice. I can have two patients with the exact same diagnosis. Their demographics are very similar. One of them, when I explain to them what we think the problem is, they just fall apart. Okay? Another person, exact same situation. Oh, thank you. I know we can't necessarily completely cure this. But at least we know what's going on. There's some things that we can do that can help. Now, clearly, some people are born with a more negative mindset and others with a more positive mindset. But there are ways that we can tweak our minds regardless of how we're intrinsically wired. So what I'd like to suggest is that true happiness comes from within. 
And it can only be achieved if we live a balanced life guided by compassion and wisdom. So what do I mean by internal balance? I don't mean going from a chaotic, crazy world, crazy life, where everything's totally upside down all the time, to this bland, you know, you're on a mountaintop um, meditating all day. That's not realistic, right? But there's a thing called the resiliency zone. We're going to have fluctuations throughout the day, throughout our lives. But can we keep from going outside of that resiliency zone? Are we euphoric out of reality of what's really going on or trying to, to drink or whatever it might be, drugs, or to try and boost up how we're feeling? Or do we get so down that, again, we're not really living our lives? So the key is staying in that resiliency zone. So what can we do to stay in that resiliency zone? Well, what I'd like to suggest is it starts with some wisdom. But what is wisdom? I'd like to suggest that it's making the most appropriate choices after carefully considering all the information gathered by both our heart and our mind. Why do I say heart and mind? Well, what, this is what I'm talking about. The heart and the mind are actually interconnected and interdependent, whether we like it or not. Um, there's a term called the heart mind. When I had my first private audience with His Holiness, he kept talking about the heart mind. I didn't know what the heck he was talking about. Um, but it's interesting, in Sanskrit, um, there's a word called sitta. Throughout Asia, I've been in Asia 26 times now, throughout Asia, there's not a separate term traditionally for heart and for mind. It's heart mind or sitta. In Chinese, it's xi, and then it's different word in different languages. But the idea is that the heart or compassion and wisdom, mind, they're interconnected, whether we like it or not. So as an example, in medicine, it's not just the science, it's just not looking at data. That's not going to do it. You've been there where all they're doing is looking at the data and not really even listening to what you have to say, right? Um, it's also an art. It's a science and an art, the intangibles. So in medicine, if you have a patient that's, that is sitting there like this, and if you're buried on the computer putting in information, you're not getting the full picture. We have to have eye contact, whether it's in medicine or in any kind of communication you have with someone. You have to use your intuition, respecting them, even if they have a different point of view, um, authenticity and building relationships. And it's the same in personal relationships. My granddaughter, again, little little plug along with her, her mother, um, my daughter. Um, and fortunately, um, compassion is intrinsic. We're 70, 75% of infants, you can show that they're intrinsically compassionate. Some are not necessarily that way. But it's intrinsic to our nature. So the key is to get back to recognizing and connecting with our heart and mind in a balanced way. So what is compassion? This is really important because this is where a lot of people get off track. And what we agreed on when we put together this exhibition of our definition of compassion. The intention to respond with kindness toward those who might benefit, motivated by a true concern for their well-being, not what am I going to get out of it by being nice to someone. Sure, we always have in the back of our mind oftentimes, well, you know, if I'm a little extra nice, you know, maybe I'll get a little bit more chocolate, you know, spray put onto that, that uh, cone of ice cream or something like that. But the main motivation has to be a true concern. So it's really the golden rule. Um, love thy neighbor as thyself. As you go back to the Torah and the Leviticus in 7th century BCE. But if also you look at any faith traditions, it's all basically the same tr thing. So that's true compassion. And when it's compassion to treat thy neighbor as thyself, it's also treat thyself as they treat thy neighbor. You know, have compassion for yourself too. So kind of, why do I say kindness toward those who might benefit rather than what you would find if you looked in Webster's Dictionary where it says a kindness toward those who are suffering? The reason that's important is that suffering is actually a mistranslation of the original term in Sanskrit, which was dukkha. The antonym of dukkha is sukha, 
or to be at ease or in balance. Remember, I keep talking about living a balanced life. In balance. Dukkha is non-ease or out of balance. And the original analogy for Dukkha was probably the wheels of an ox cart being out of alignment. Now, why is that important? Well, first of all, if we talk about out of balance, I can relate to that. I don't want somebody to look at me and be nice to me because they think I'm suffering. And you don't, you're not changing a baby's diaper because they're suffering. Um, it's a very depressing way to go through life, that everybody you look at is suffering. Um, and it leads to all kinds of stress, depression, and which are skyrocketing in the United States. So the other thing, as I mentioned before, is that to be in balance, to be compassionate, helps other people, but it will also, the science shows, will help you, and that's a whole other conversation. In contrast, beware of absorbing the suffering of others. That's affective empathy. People talk about being empathetic. Well, affective empathy can be very, very dangerous, and I'll explain why. And that's the traditional, original term of empathy was affective empathy, which is feel my pain. Now, it's true that instinctively, when we see someone that's fallen down and is maybe is in pain, that we might feel emotion, that emotion ourselves. That's normal. The difference is to feel that you have to push yourself to hold on to their pain and carry it for them. That's what's very, very dangerous. That's dangerous. Can you imagine a physician that every time a patient walked into the room, they, have, they feel an obligation to take on that suffering, to take on that pain? And unfortunately, a lot of physicians and nurses haven't learned the difference between compassion and, and empathy and is contributing to the burnout in the medical field. And you're feeling it also in the political environment that you're in and all the other things that you deal with. It's overwhelming. And you don't want to take that on. It's really important. Affective empathy causes stress, which has skyrocketed in the United States. Even before the pandemic, 60% of the US adult population was dealing with chronic stress. What that does is it clouds our judgment. We don't see things clearly when we're emotionally involved. And it leads into inaccurate conclusions and then even despite best of intentions, oftentimes wrong actions that can be counterproductive. We know from science that repeatedly absorbing the pain of others, whether intentional or unintentional, leads to anxiety and chronic distress, numerous stress-related physical and emotional illnesses, cardiovascular diabetes, I mean, the list goes on and on, um, empathic fatigue, not compassion fatigue, empathic fatigue, and you just get exhausted and you just want to shut it all off. You turn off the TV, you don't want to pick up the paper anymore, you don't want to get on social media, because you're just exhausted by what the media is throwing at you, right? Um, then it leads to social disengagement and burnout. Also, it's important to know that those that are able to take on the suffering of others with avoiding personal harm have required extensive training under expert supervision. The Dalai Lama is really good at taking on the suffering of others. Um, Desmond Tutu is really good at it, or was good at it. Um, it's called Tong Lin in Buddhism, taking on the suffering of others. But we don't have that luxury of years of training in how to do that. So you want to stay away from taking on that suffering. Also, it's not a prerequisite for effectively responding to people with compassion, so don't feel like you have to do it. I really like this three stanza quote by Hillel, the Jewish um, scholar. He said, um, if I'm not for myself, who will be with me? If, if I'm only for myself, what am I? And if not now, if not now, when? A balance between compassion for self, compassion for others, and action. 
So at the end of ex the exhibition here, we have an action station. So once you calm yourself at the beginning, with the calming at the beginning, that station, putting you in the position and in the mindset, in the heart-mind position, to then absorb the imagery, and then you can end with the action station. It's intentional. So speaking of intentional, I'll give you an example of compassion paired with wisdom. This is the king of Bhutan. I've been there now six times. I'll be back again this year. Um, they measure happiness by, uh, I mean, uh, um, uh, their, their economy, not gross national product, but gross national happiness. You've probably heard about that before. So when the pandemic hit, they're in a landlocked country, Buddhist kingdom in the Himalayas, 750 people spread out all over the place, hard to get to. They accumulated enough vaccine to inoculate the entire adult population. The king said, okay, we're gonna take 14 days for everybody to be inoculated. And because I want all my subjects to have this opportunity, I'm not gonna get inoculated until the 14th day. Within 14 days, 95% of the population was vaccinated. All in this together, we're interconnected, we're interdependent, um, and compassion and wisdom, bringing it together. What are some of the root causes of being unhappy and out of balance? I'd suggest that one of them is over time losing sight of our core values. We get so swept up in what we're doing that we kind of lose track of that. But the, the, why that's important is that our core values help in determining our goals, our short-term goals, our long-term goals. They should. And those, in turn, help in determining our daily priorities and our actions. Again, going back to the fact that you're here. It hopefully aligns with your values of what's important to you, and one of those things is to live a more healthier, balanced life. So ask yourself, what are two or three of my core values. Just Let's just take 10 seconds or so, or 15 seconds, just think about that. And are my personal and professional goals realistic, realistic in alignment with my core values? Think about that. So let's go through what I like to call the 24 stone rule. Uh, so imagine you have 24 stones. Each one represents a day in, uh, an hour in your, in your day, okay? And just imagine for a minute, just how many stones do I typically have stacked for sleep? How many for my work or for exercise or for something else? Just think about how you have those stones stacked right now. And just think, um, think back to when you were, let's say, in high school, middle school, something that you really enjoyed, um, that you kept saying, you know, I'd really like to get back to that, or that was a great hobby, or I really enjoyed something, whatever it might be. And darn it, if I only had the time, if I only had the time, if I could only get back in balance. So take one of those stones, cut it into four pieces, so it's 15 minutes. And just ask yourself, out of all these different stacks, could I put onto my calendar 15 minutes once a week, just once a week for four weeks, and dedicate it to that thing that I kept saying I wanted to do? Well, it's just sitting in a closet and closing the door, <laughs> whatever it might be. And just set yourself up for success, not for failure. You don't want to say, I'm going to take two stones and every day I'm gonna you know, do such and such for a month. It's like New Year's, Eve, New Year's resolutions, no way it's gonna happen. So set yourself up for success. Think what do, you want to, what do I wanna do 15 minutes once a week? And then after four weeks, reassess the situation. Do I wanna add another quarter of a stone somewhere? Maybe for another four weeks? This may be not working out, not what I thought, maybe I should Maybe try something else. Just think, think about that. 
gradually getting back into balance. You know, put your toe in the water. Don't jump in. Just put your toe in the water and try it out. So balance requires nurturing what makes us whole. So I am very careful that, sure, I'm a physician. I'm there to help people. But I don't stamp that on my forehead and look at myself as a physician. No, um, that's only a piece of the pie. Uh, hopefully, there's more to life than just doing that one thing. So, you know, I mean, uh, family's important to me, and we can define what we mean by family, the arts, my physical and emotional health. You know, the list goes on and on. So don't pigeon your whole, pigeonhole yourself. Be authentic to who you are and find ways to nurture those other parts that make you whole, that frust you're frustrated because you don't seem to think to have your time for doing it. Now, certainly throughout our careers, we're going to have to titrate, God bless you, we're going to have to titrate up and down, you know, some of these things. I mean, that's the reality of it. But don't lose sight of those things that are really important to you. And have realistic expectations. You're not going to be able to do everything you want to do. I mean, just you can't. You can't. So based on your values and your goals and your priorities, learn when to say no. Learn when to say no. It's important. And play to your strengths. That's really important, too. I mean, um, I'm dyslexic, you know, so I get help. When I'm doing international work, you know, I make sure I have a good translator. Um, I was met, talking to someone else before that I had one of, the medical, one of my medical school classmates was a really good um, note taker, so I paid her for her notes, you know, so I wouldn't have to write them down. Um, and I could, you know, pay more attention to what the professor was saying. So play to your strengths and get help where you need it. Get help where you need it. And have humility. Have humility. Um, be kind. We're all idiots. <laughs> we all make mistakes. None of us has got it all right. I sure don't. You know, His Holiness is the first one to say, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> and he laughs about it. You know, I mean, ease up on yourself. It's okay. It's all right. So another thing that gets in our way is destructive emotions. They contribute to our unhappiness. One of the big ones is anger, frustration, hate, whatever it might be. And she's saying here, thank you for calling anger management. What the F do you want? <laughs> so, I mean, it's true. Uh, occasional anger is unavoidable. I mean, we all get angry from time to time. The key is, what is your strategy for dealing with it? Do you have a healthy strategy for dealing with it, which we're going to keep talking about? Um, greed is another big one, selfishness. Okay, you got to have it all. Um, ego, arrogance. Um, this one says, I solved my low self-esteem by becoming arrogant. <laughs> Another one is envy. Of course the Johnson's got the big cloud. You know, just remember, no one's going to write on your gravestone, had a great house. Okay, they're not going to do it. It's not going to happen. Um, I really like this three stanza quote. By His Holiness, he says, man and woman, and women, I'm sure, the ones that are going to save this world, it's not going to be us, us guys. Um, but anyway, a man, and I put in, and women, sacrifices his health for money, then sacrifices money to recuperate. It's an imbalance. It's an imbalance. He's so anxious about the future that he does not enjoy the present. Smell the roses. Go on that walk with someone you care about, you know. He lives as if he's never going to die, then dies having never really lived. You know, this is your chance. This is your chance. So what's the antidote to all this? Well, there's no one magic bullet, but there are some things that we can do that can be helpful. Empower the individual. You have the power to make some changes find and develop healthy strategies for dealing with life's challenges. The other exhibition is actually just an exhibition of my work. It's traveling around the world. It's called A Sacred Path, Seeking True Happiness. And um, it was just at the Tibet Museum in India and then Museo Camera in India and just in Mexico City next it goes to uh, Bern, Switzerland. It has a six-step process, a universal process for navigating through life's challenges. 
And this is relevant whether for me in medicine or dealing with a family member, whatever it might be. Step number one, and this is in sequence, focus on the present. We have to be focused. If we're not focused, then it's less likely that we're going to understand what's going on and then come up with a reasonable strategy. So focus on the present. So if I'm in the operating room and um, done an examination, do the testing, talk to the patient, they've signed an op permit, I'm going in, I'm starting to do surgery, and I'm getting in there and things aren't quite what I was expecting to find. If I'm thinking about you know, something else like someone forgot to get this equipment or gosh, I gotta go run over to the office or something like that and I'm not focused, I'm, I'm not gonna pick up on those things. So I have to focus first, that's step number one. Self-awareness, am I tensing my body up? Am I clenching my teeth? Am I moving too quickly? Um, am I rushing, okay? So if you don't have that self-awareness, you're not getting those red flags. You're not picking up on those red flags. So if you're in a relationship with someone and you're not focused and then you're not see, fe feeling that tension building up in your chest or your queasiness in your stomach, then you don't, you're not getting those warning signs. So step number two is self-awareness. So when I feel that in the operating room, I gotta be aware of it and then I gotta figure out a way to calm myself down. So what I'll do is back, up, back away from the operating table for a minute and just pause and just breathe, okay? I can't be worried that someone thinks, oh gosh, Dr. Kolk is supposed to know what he's doing and you know, why is he stopping? Um, but actually what I find out later is the nurses really recognize that and respect that more than the ones that are just barreling ahead, okay? Um, so in order to do that, I have to resolve my, any destructive emotions, my bias, like, oh, I was supposed to be finding this, or my ego that, gosh, I'm supposed to know all the answers, whatever it might be. We've got to put all that aside, okay? So if you're in a relationship with someone and you think you know what they're talking about, put your biases aside and really listen. But that takes some training. That, that takes some practice to do. And then hopefully I try to summon a little bit of wisdom while I'm there and figure out what's really going on and figure out what I need to do next. And then hopefully respond with some compassion. What's the best thing to do? Wisdom and compassion, combining the two. It's really crucial in any kind of interaction that you have, any kind of challenging situation that you might have. So again, focus, self-awareness, calm yourself, resolve the destructive ego bias, recruit wisdom and respond with compassion. So that's what the exhibition that I have going around is all about. And that's how you get to some true happiness. So another thing that's helpful is to redefine family. And we don't have time to go into it now, but the photograph that's over there in the, the background of that, but it's all about expanding my view of who's my real family. And because the, the reality is that we're all interconnected and all interdependent. I mean, just think of the people that are working right here behind the scenes to put this together. And how did the electricity get here? And how is it this thing's working? And where did the water come from? And, you know, all the different things that we all have to depend on. None of us is doing it on our own. We all have to work together. So family, expand your view of family. Respect everyone. Respect everyone. You find out so much just by that, that ability to do that. And you'll kind of get a better sense of how do I balance my life? What's really important to me by listening to other people? In uh, Buddhism, they have this thing, the interconnected knot. And it's about this idea that we're all interconnected, interdependent, both past, present, and future. So future generations environment are dependent on us. And we're dependent on past generations. See the humanity in others. So when we had, um, I was asked to, to um, put together a summit of museum professionals to go to India and have a summit with the Dalai Lama on compassion. And one of the exercises we did was to stand facing, paired up with one other, other individual in the group um, for three minutes, that far apart as in the picture, and just looking directly into their eyes for three minutes. Talk about interconnection and really sensing the humanity in others. Just try that for one minute. 
even with someone that you know, you think you know well. Try that. And if you're uncomfortable with that, try it with your animal that you love. <laughs> it works well there, too, because they're sentient beings. Um, so let's get down to some practical strategies, OK? Number one, you've got to get a good night's sleep. Look to your left and right. One out of the three of you has chronic sleep deprivation. <laughs> Okay, that's the statistics in the United States. So um, if you want, feel free to get a hold of me later. I can get you a handout on um, some sleep strategies. You can contact me at contact at shadesofcompassion.org. I can send that to you and uh, also give you some other suggestions about who to get in touch with to help with all that. A um, couple other things that you can do. Um, so one thing that can be helpful is money management. Um, I've always tried to live at least 10% below my means and put the money away and try to, you know, put it in a safe way to invest it and whatever. So always, you can always do that, 10% below. Everybody can pretty much do that. Uh, ask yourself when you go out shopping, do I need something or do I want something? Um, sure, treat yourself every once in a while, but then again, think, do I really need it or do I just want it? And why? Why do I want it? Um, do my children or grandchildren, whatever it might be, um, need more toys or more time with me? And hone your ability to stay focused So, on the present. So neuroplasticity, some of you may have heard of that. That's the reality that even up to about age, at least 80, um, we're all able to change the anatomy of our brain. We're able to change the uh, connectivity in our brain. So we have over 100 billion neurons in our brains and they're in clusters and then there are these super highways of axons that go from one cluster to another so if i've practiced habitually a bad habit then the neural pathways the amount of myelin that increases conductivity for those pathways increases it hypertrophies but if we can practice positive things, we can actually, you can see on MRI scans, that area atrophies, and then the good neural pathways hypertrophy. Okay? So you can do that with simply with 20 minutes of meditation twice a week for four to six weeks, and that'll change. But like anything else, you got to exercise, you got to practice, you got to keep doing it. So meditation, well, um, I'd go nuts if I were standing, if I were sitting all day trying to meditate or even for 30 minutes. I don't do very well with that. I just know myself. When I'm in China they, or Taiwan, they do walking meditation. You can do standing meditation. If you're not going to fall asleep, you can do lying down meditation. Um, but there are other ways that you can do it too. So let's say you're going to watch a soccer match of uh, you know, children or grandchildren. So at, uh, at halftime, get up and do a walking meditation around the track. Um, go for a bike ride. Um, when I was in Cambodia, they have the sign about walking up and down the stairs. You can do walking meditation. Um, for me, um, I, I do swimming meditation. I can, I, I, I'm counting my breaths, I'm, uh, my strokes, I'm focusing on my breath, my aerodynamics through the water, and that sort of thing. And for me, that's a form of meditation. So one of the first things I asked Barbara before coming here is, that, is there a place I can swim? And sure enough, there's one right down the street. So I swam yesterday, and I'm swimming tomorrow morning. So I'd go nuts if I didn't do that. So you can do that. But also, there are forms of mini, what's called mini meditation. Whoops. Um, one is called loving kindness meditation, and that's behind here, number 10 on the list. So you can read about that later. Um, a color. So. This young lady has a red purse. When I see the color red, I think of heart, I think of compassion. Or maybe gratitude is something you want to think about. And maybe the color purple is something that you relate to the concept of gratitude. So pick out a color. So as you're walking around during the day, when you see that color, it triggers your mind. Okay. Um, something you wear uh, on your wrist, uh, a, a locket. Uh, some jewelry, something that reminds you of something that's important to you, a value. Okay, so every morning you put that on, or maybe you have a little saying that you put on your mirror when you're brushing your teeth, just something to get you off 
on the right track. It takes a second to do something like that. Um, a picture, a screensaver. So guess who's the screensaver on my um, cell phone? <laughs> <laughs> two, little, two little girls. I won't say who they are, but you get the picture. Um, no pun intended. Uh, or the same on your computer, on your laptop. What's, what's your screensaver? Um, the access code that you use for getting onto your cell phone or your computer, what are the numbers or the letters? Do they mean something to you? Could they mean something to you? Okay, real easy to do. Tactile, so um, as an example, when I would be going from room to room to see patients for privacy, the door is closed before I walk in. I've got patients in four or five rooms at a time. I'm going back and forth and in and out and in and out. So what I would do, would every time I would put my hand on the doorknob, which was round, I would um, feel its shape, um, its cool temperature, um, take a breath, not squeeze it real tight. Why am I here? Open the door. Takes three seconds to do. So little things like that that you can do that can really be very powerful because with neuroplasticity, it, before you know it, it becomes first nature and just becomes part of who you are. Um, a positive smile, particularly to a stranger, three times a day. At first, it'll feel forced, but after a while, it'll become more natural. And the science shows that just simply by smiling, it has a positive effect on those and it has a positive effect on you. Really simple. A daily journal, maybe in the evening before you go to bed, about something positive that happened in your day. Maybe pick one from column A and one from column B. Don't try to do them all. Just if a couple kind of resonate with you, you might want to try them out. This is a really good one. This one I like a lot. First bite of food at a meal. So when you sit down for a meal, pick out a little something on the plate. Maybe it's a pea. And just think, where did it come from? You know, the clouds, the soil, the rain, um, the farmer. You know, the packaging, the cook, um, you know, all the different things that brought it here. And then think, well, when I put it in my mouth, you know, what's it going to shape, is, is what's going to feel like on my tongue? Look at its shape, look at its color, and think, what's it going to taste like when I bite down on, into it? Then put it in your mouth, feel it with your tongue, bite, taste, Chew it. If it's something that's harder, make sure you chew it till it's the consistency of toothpaste because from a digestive perspective, um, you need to chew every your meal very, very well before you swallow it. A little medical advice. Till it's the consistency of toothpaste. And just by doing that with the beginning of each of your meals, it takes maybe 15 seconds, it'll slow down your eating, you'll be more hopefully more focused on the food. And it's a form of meditation. It's a form of meditation. Um, a song or a smell, a perfume or something, a scent, a mantra that you have, that you make up. Those can all be good. Just breathing. Three slow, deep breaths. Breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth. Um, word choice. So I try to um, introduce myself if somebody asks me what my profession was or is. I would say physician. Not surgeon. Surgeon would imply that I'm there to do surgery. No, I'm there to help people. Some people might benefit from some surgery, but um, others wouldn't. Um, but if I am keep introducing myself as a surgeon, then that's my job. I'm supposed to do operations. No, that's not right. Or, gosh, I hate that. Well, I might dislike things. One or two things I do hate, but um, just by using the term hate, you know, it just has a connotation. Or third world. No, there's nobody who lives in, a, in third world. Um, that's maybe Jupiter. Under-resourced, that's a different term. But we get into these habits because we've heard them before and we just kind of get into that mindset. It's not intentional. It's nothing that we've done wrong. But maybe just think about the terms we use and maybe just tweak it a little bit from time to time. My wife is a big Jimmy Buffett fan. Um, he unfortunately passed away this last year, and she's still she's listening to his music all the time. 
but uh, she uh, she pulled us all, my daughter and son-in-law, my daughters and my son-in-law and me to a Jimmy Buffett concert in D.C. and we had our uh, Hawaiian shirts and all that kind of crazy stuff. And he had this song, Weather With You, it's called, it says, everywhere you go, you always bring the weather with you. And it's true, it's true. Um, so it's important to uh, surround yourself by more positivity, not so much of the negativity, because it'll, it'll carry around with you all day long. Avoid doom scrolling. We all tend to do that, and that's what the media wants us to do. Um, that's how they get our attention. And that's that affective empathy I was talking about. They want to get you all riled up, you know, show you these graphic things and how terrible it is and there's murders there and, you know, this. And that's what they're trying to do. They're sucking you in. They're sucking you in. Don't go for it. Try to get off of that doom scrolling. And the same with the newspaper. That's how they sell the newspapers. It's their negativity bias all the time all the time. Don't get sucked in by it. Find positives. There's a lot, of, a lot of positives in the world. So see the positives. See the positives. Um, those little things that someone does that maybe you weren't thinking about. I mean, the people here that are doing the, that are videoing this, they're doing it on their own time. They're, they're doing it as volunteers. I mean, it's incredible. The people in your community, the things that they do behind the scenes, it's incredible. So rejoice in that. See that. Most people in most of the environments are positive environments, not destruction and hate. Stay physically active and make it fun. Find something that you enjoy doing and make it fun. And find synergies. So when I'm doing international work, sometimes I'll take a family member one-on-one -on -one with me um, I'm doing my photography, which I love. I'm trekking in the Himalayas, so physical and emotional health. This is not multitasking, okay? That's different. That's when you're constantly distracted by multiple things going on. This is different. And when I'm there, then some of the times I'm in the, I'm in the operating room or whatever in the clinic, and we're, we're, I'm showing or demonstrating a particular procedure. I'm learning about the culture and getting enriched by that. And as I said, sometimes I'll take family members. This is my daughter, Melanie, up on the upper left. And she loved being in the operating room. This is in Vietnam. She's a young teenager. And she just, she, um, when she was, she always liked being around medicine. If there was, she was three years old and there was a squirrel that was run over in the road, we'd be walking. She'd be having two sticks out dissecting it. God knows. Um, so that's just the way she is. So she loved being in the operating room and helping teaching them English and all that sort of thing. Whereas my other daughter, Lara, below, that's again as a young teenager, um, that's in Vietnam. Um, she's a superb dancer. So this is in a, an orphanage for deaf children in Vietnam. And she's using vibrations to teach them, teach them dance. So there are ways of create, creatively incorporating family, regardless of what their interests are. And that's finding synergies. And that's my wife, Cecilia, and that's at a Tibet orphanage. She loves being with little, tiny little children, and she likes helping take care of them. That's in, uh, in India. Yeah, just, just brief the book, if you're, anyone's interested in, we have it right here, and um, half of the proceeds will go to the, um, to the um, a museum and half to our, our foundation. And uh, it's received words and whatnot. If you're interested, you can always in contact me through our foundation, Shades of Compassion Foundation. Um, you're welcome to reach out to me at any time. Um, I do these speaking engagements around the world. I just uh, did three in, in Boston. It was two months ago. I was just in Tokyo doing them. And um, so I, I enjoy doing this, all different kinds of um, groups. Um, so uh, yeah, feel free to, to be in touch if you're, if you're interested at any time. And um, so yeah, thank you very much. Uh, for your time, and um, I'll just kind of open it up a little bit to conversation, any questions, and we'll kind of leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs> any questions at all? Yes. 
So the question is, like touching a doorknob, is that a form of mindfulness or just bringing you back to the present? Um, I think it's a combination. Um, it's training myself. It's ch changing that, um, that uh, there's neural connections. Um, and it's making me aware, more aware, um, for sure. Um, and then it you know, just helps calm me also at the same time. And it's reassuring, uh, reassuring, yeah. Uh, yes. So the question is, have I noticed a change in our capacity for compassion since COVID? I think it's added a significant number of additional challenges. There were already, um, pre-pandemic, 60% of U.S. adults were dealing with chronic stress. That was pre-pandemic and an epidemic of all kinds of stress-related physical and emotional illnesses. It's going through the roof even more now, and there's greater uh, burnout, um, social disengagement, for sure, since the pandemic. Uh, it's really put one more layer of, of, of stress. And I'm even seeing it when I'm in other countries. Um, U.S. is far uh, and away ahead of a lot of other countries in the stress quotient and um, um, these, these stress-related problems, but it's even worse now for sure. Um, yeah. yeah. What else? Yes. Question is, what was it like to be with the Dalai Lama? Um, hmm. He's very special. Um, maybe it's my imagination, but there's a real energy that without him saying anything, just walking into the room, he's extremely humble. And I say this in a respectful way, he doesn't take himself too seriously. Um, he repeatedly says he's just a simple monk. Um, he's very genuine and authentic. There's, he's not pretentious at all. Um, he's able to really focus in, whether it's someone's uh, struggles or whether it's someone's joy. Um, I kind of look at him sort of almost as a, a wise grandfather, even though he's only a little bit, he's uh, 88 now, I'm 72. Um, but when I was first with him, we were sitting and holding hands, and um, I would have my one hand here, and then he would put his hand in mine. I'd have my other hand on top of his to kind of try to hold that precious vessel, you know, and try to soak in, you know, some of, of, of him. But he has a very gentle hand, a soft. Um, um, yeah, he's just very genuine. Very genuine. And uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks for asking the question. Yeah. So the question, part of the first part of it, and I hope I have it right, is that in our society, there's this sense that we've got to go and take on and all those struggles and, you know, fix everything um, and take, take, take on the struggle, right? And the other part is that, um, so first responding to that, um, I don't think that, well, I've spent a lot of time in Asia, and there is a significant feeling of responsibility to take care of others, particularly the elder, and to maintain your honor. In fact, the suicide rate in Japan, when I was just giving a presentation in Japan, um, in Tokyo, um, one of the questions had to do with why is there a high suicide, high suicide rate among women in particular um, in Japan. And um, women take on this added responsibility and sacrifice their own health, compassion for self, frequently in order to do that. Um, so there are parts of the world where actually there's even more of that feeling of obligation than it is in the United States. Um, that being said, it is a fairly common um, struggle of how much can I realist how much should I take on and trying to take on too much. And that's why I'm saying about find, not find your lane, but 
you know, where can I help and focus right on that area where I have the most skill, where I have the most ability to make a difference. Don't try to take it all on. Don't try to take it all on. Don't try to take it all on because you're, you're going to not be successful at any of it. Find something where you can make a difference and focus on that, balancing it with taking care of yourself. So the other part of what she, she was saying, if others didn't hear it, was that she has a friend who, um, with 9-11, felt they had to take on the suffering. And this is someone that was working with her llama. And, when the, and the llama never really got angry at her until she said she did that. And that's when the llama got upset because she didn't have the training to do it. Okay? So you can't take on everybody's problems. You can't do it. Um, and so I always have to come back to, for me personally, where are my skill sets and where can I make a difference? Because if you go to um, quantum physics, well, you don't want to go to quantum physics. We could talk about that for an hour. But um, basically, it's the concept of energy forces. And we're all interconnected and interdependent. It's a matter of the summation of all the parts that really makes the difference. Okay? So don't think you've got to do it all yourself. Do your little part, and the summation of that is the thing that makes the difference. And some people's concept of the, uh, uh, a, a god, um, if you get into mysticism, it's the god would be more of the energy force, but that energy force is actually the summation of all the smaller energy forces. That's a whole other, again, a whole other conversation. Um, but I hope that kind of gets into what you were, you were referring to. I think I'll leave it at that. But yeah. <laughs> Thank you.